Good morning. It's great to be here. You've been listening all morning. You've been listening to wonderful ideas. You've been listening to words, many words. You're going to listen to even more words coming up. So before we uh, are going to move any further, let's listen to something else. Let's listen to the power of the human voice. I feel like Maria Carey on New Year's Eve. Beautiful, isn't it? Thank you for listening. What does Steve Jobs have to do with opera? Why does the opera guy start his talk with Steve Jobs? What do Fortune 500 companies like Apple, Netflix, Google have to do with the business of opera? And the most important question that we will ask today, is innovation finally coming to the opera house? That's such a trendy word, innovation. And then there's even a trendier word, disruption. Everybody, everybody wants to be disruptive and innovative. But when people are talking about those terms, they're talking about a very simple business idea that every company in the world should realize. And that is, if you are not changing the way you're thinking, according to the world around you, according to a brave new world that is ever-changing with new technologies and new generations, you're going to die. There are many multiple examples of that in the history of business. When you think about typical companies, every company has a core product that they manufacture today, that they are producing today. And if they're a smart company, they have to activate their research and development departments to come up with new products for future generations so that they connect with the future customers and audiences of tomorrow. Some examples of this principle are Blockbuster Video. Do you remember them? They competed neck to neck with Netflix a little over a decade ago. Blockbuster failed. Netflix succeeded. Blockbuster leaders exploited the product of today. They thought of themselves as being in the DVD rental business. Netflix never thought of themselves as being in the DVD rental business. They thought of themselves as being in the entertainment business. Blockbuster went out of business in 2010, and Netflix continued to develop, disrupt, and harness new technologies for their own growth. And today, they're valued at over $100 billion, and they're one of the hottest companies on Wall Street. Let's do another example. Do you remember Palm Pilot? <laughs> Whatever happened to them? And why is the iPhone in its 10th iteration? How come Apple keeps surprising us, keeps turning the words on its head again and again with inventions of the iPod, the iPad, the iPhone, the i who knows what coming next? Because Palm Pilot never understood that it has to be more than just about the product. It has to be about the experience. And then a final example before we go back into opera. Amazon started in 1994 as a modest online bookstore. Today, it is the biggest online retailer in the universe. And then you have Sears that was the dominant retailer in the United States until the 1970s employing over 400,000 people. 
What's happening in Sears? The betting on Wall Street is that they will be out of business soon, sold for retail, while Amazon continues to innovate and invent and come up with new ideas, even though it is becoming a dominant player in the market. So what's in common for all those businesses? The leaders of the organizations that failed were not able to make the transition between the product of today to the product of the future. They continue to exploit their core product without developing and exploring new product. All right, so what all this have to do with opera? Opera is an art form that was invented in 1597, over four centuries ago. But when it was invented, it was the most disruptive and innovative art form you can imagine. After all, who has ever heard of a theater where people are singing to each other instead of talking to each other? Designers and artists from all over the world came together to come up with ideas of how to push forward this art form. All of the art forms came together, theater, the human voice, classical music, design of sets and costumes, dance. And underneath it all, it had this revolutionary principle, the power of the human voice, the power of the human voice. Opera does not use microphone. There are no amplification in opera. Yet opera singers are trained to reach 10,000 seats and overcome a an orchestra of 100. That's the underlying principle of opera. And theaters at the time, when it was invented, Baroque theater was designed and built so that they can complement this idea. Baroque theaters used the most technologically advanced, sophisticated machinery that literally took this idea of deus ex machina, this theatrical idea, and brought literally gods from the machine. They had those elaborate flying machines that allowed singers to come from the heaven onto the stage. Sophisticated traps that opened and closed, revealing characters that then disappeared. All those artists came together to create illusion of the supernatural and the magical. And then that kind of innovation trickled through the centuries. In the 18th century, the world recognized an absolute genius in the form of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who wrote and completely revolutionized the way singers were singing. He came up with operas like Don Giovanni and Marriage of Figaro that explored complex and very psychological themes and subjects that blow our mind today because they seem so modern to us. And then, in the 19th century, arguably the most innovative composer came into prominence. He was an egomaniacal German composer named Richard Wagner. And Wagner, not unlike the creators of Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings, created a whole world of mythology and adventure where gods and monsters, dragons, dwarves, and giants were chasing some gold. He went even another step. He created a theater from scratch in Bayreuth where all his wacky, adventurous ideas could become alive. And then he did one more thing. Netflix thought that they invented binge-watching. Wagner programmed four operas over a week, 17 hours of music. He invented binge-watching. <laughs> and then we got to the 20th century, and something changed. The rise of popular culture happened. TV was invented. The Hollywood movie was invented. Opera encountered the biggest obstacle so far. Suddenly, it was not as interesting as before. Suddenly, the art form that, was, that belonged to everybody, to the people on the street, to women that were washing their clothes in the river and singing Italian arias, that was no longer the case. Opera moved into an ivory tower and became an elitist art form. An, an art form that sometimes seemed like it belongs in a museum, gathering dust. How many people here go to the opera? How many people don't mind the opera as long as they don't have to go? <laughs> I talk to a lot of people 
about opera. That's my job as a general director. And I have to tell you that not everybody likes opera. You won't be surprised. Do you know what most people think about when I say the word opera? <laughs> That's not a joke. This is some of the debilitating stigmas that opera has to deal with every day. You talk to people and tell them and invite them to come, and they would say, oh, no, this is too long. It lasts three to four hours. I'm not going to understand anything. It's sung in a foreign language. Yeah, but we have super titles. <laughs> it involves a tremendous suspension of disbelief. Opera is when you stab a guy in the back, and instead of bleeding, they're singing for half an hour. <laughs> and then there is that cliche that was invented in the 1970s. It ain't over until the fat lady sings. But I have to tell you, opera is the most magnificent art form that I know. I was on my way to medical school to pursue a medical career, and I left everything and decided to be an opera director. Because opera combines theater, music, and design on the highest, most ambitious scale possible. Hundreds of people on stage, chorus, principals, acrobats, dancers, in the pit, dozens of musicians are playing under the conductor. And then backstage, you have an army of technicians and artists that are working together to bring stories uh, that are human, and universal to the audience. And if it goes well, opera has an opportunity to tell stories on such an epic, romantic scale that really sweeps the audience off their feet. That's what happened to me. But how did opera develop and change in the past few years? The name of the conference is Solving X. I didn't really know what exactly that means. In my mind, it's solving Generation X, or maybe solving gener Generation Y, the millennials. God help us, Generation Z, <laughs> my daughter. How are they going to look at this art form 400 years old? So let me tell you a little story. Last month, I went to a museum, and I was reading a plaque that explained about the exhibit that I was visiting. And in comes this beautiful mother and her gorgeous two-year-old daughter. And they were reading the same plaque that I was reading. And the daughter reached her hand and touched the words and tried to swipe them. <laughs> and the mother smiled at her and said, sweetheart, it's not going to work. And so the baby started crying and screaming, and she said, the words are broken. That's not fair. <laughs> and to me, that was a moment of great epiphany. Because when design and art are not interactive, they are broken. Let me repeat that one more time. When art and design are not interactive, they are broken. We live in a world where we are bombarded by 100 million Images, pictures, text messages, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. I'm surprised you're still listening, actually. <laughs> how, how do we compete with that with a classical art form that has been around for centuries? What do we do? So let's go back into how we started and talk about what is in the core. What is the core product of opera? The core product of opera is really a handful of very popular titles that we call the ABC. Aida, Butterfly, Carmen, a couple more. Every company in every city, every year, are doing those shows. They're beautiful, they're great. But even within those war horses, even within those well-familiar titles, innovation, technology, multimedia, new ways of telling those stories become very prevalent in many opera companies. Let's listen and look at an example.
This is a production of Magic Flute, the one we just watched, that was done in Germany a few years ago. Stop motion animation, live projections that have 3D mapping technology, an interaction between singers and animation, allow these stories to be told to a new generation. Now, this production was so successful that it went from city to city and was extremely popular with new audiences. But then, how does opera deal with new products, with new streams of innovations? One of the ways that opera is moving forward is by veering away and branching away from the ABC products, from the Aida Butterfly Carmen. And they do that by embracing new musical styles that are extremely popular. For example, a new opera based on Pink Floyd's The Wall, a rock opera, was premiered last year. A new jazz opera about the life of Charlie Parker is coming to Atlanta next year. A tango opera from Argentina called Maria de Buenos Aires. And the mariachi opera are making the rounds all over the United States. A second stream of innovation has to do with themes and subjects that the opera are concentrating on. Long gone are the days that operas were just about kings and queens and gods. Today, operas are focusing on robots, on artificial intel intelligence. They're taking place in space. This is a picture from a recent opera called the Hubble Cantata. And it took iconic images from the Hubble Space Telescope, and it was accompanied by a virtual reality movie that took the audience on an immersive journey across the cosmos. They were giving 3D virtual reality glasses in the middle of the opera. And then there's Obi-Wan Kenobi. You remember him? So technique of holograms are arriving at the opera house. New technology that allows us to project Iconic opera singers like Maria Callas behind me allow us today to have Maria Callas on stage surrounded by living, breathing musicians that play with her. And in essence, you're able to watch a recital of an opera singer that has been dead for three decades. And then, possibly the most efficient and impressive innovation in opera in recent years all over the world from a business standpoint and from an artistic standpoint, are what we call second stages operas, chamber operas, as we call them in Atlanta, the discovery series. The idea behind those is that opera companies are supplementing and sometimes replacing the ABCs, those main stage large scale productions, with more intimate chamber operas that utilize fewer singers, fewer musicians, and allow those performances to go over from one venue to the other. Just imagine going to see an opera at the Botanical Gardens, or watching a jazz opera in a jazz club, or a space opera in a planetarium. The picture behind me is a picture that is from a production called Winterreise, Winter Journey, by Franz Schubert. And this is a great example of how a classical old art form like German leader is connecting to an audience in the age of the iPhone. Think about it. Think about this generation with all the distraction going on around them. Sitting in a room in a convention of 19th century style musical form like the leader where a baritone stands in front of a grand piano for 75 minutes singing 24 songs about German philosophical ideas that have to do with pain and angst. Do you think they're going to stay? Do you think they're going to stay alert? And so it's incumbent upon us to take this incredible art form that is so musical and beautiful and tells such great stories and transpose it and translate it into this generation. And so what did we do? We created a production that utilizes multimedia projections, high quality 3D mapping visuals that accompany and complement the sonic journey that the hero goes through in this opera. Now, we started with asking what the Steve Jobs have to do with opera. That's still a mystery. But you may be surprised to hear that Steve Jobs became the subject of an opera. 
Last year, the Santa Fe Opera, the biggest festival in the United States, had an opera called The Revolution of Steve Jobs. Infinite LED lights, infrared sensors were put on singers that were then tracked by 3D projection mapping to create this incredible world of Steve Jobs. So, in conclusion, opera companies all over the world are experiencing innovation and, God forbid, disruption. They're not only changing the way they are presenting their core product, the ABCs, now we know what they are, but they're also creating new works, chamber operas, that bend the genre from rock to hip hop to country music to jazz. And they do that in a fiscally innovative way that allow them to create those products with a fraction of the cost that it costs them to put it on the main stage. They are utilizing a simple business principle. And that is you must, it is incumbent upon you as a business to try to figure out what does the future look like? What is the next generation? What is generation Y going to think about this? And how do we connect with them? Because if we're going to stay in the past or even in the present, we're out. Many opera companies all over the United States and the world are embracing this approach. And here at the Atlanta Opera, we believe in this art form that is based on this revolutionary idea underneath it all, the power of the human voice. And we're working on figuring out how to connect it with future generations. Thank you so much.